Known and welcome to the Palmerston North Conference and Function Centre. My name is Jenny Marcroft and it's an absolute pleasure to be standing in front of you today for the New Zealand First State of the Nation. I'd just like to start firstly with a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you need to use the restroom, you can find them through the front doors and to either side. In the case of a fire, the emergency exits are halfway down the hallway, either to your left or right. Please gather at the car park on that side or at the front of the building if you're exiting this way, or you can go through the front doors you came from and, and gather at the front of the building. In the event, unlikely event of an earthquake, drop, cover and hold. <laughs> One thing before I move on is uh, don't be that person. Please turn your phones right now onto silent. Thank you very much. In 2020, Winston Peters and the New Zealand First Party were cast out into the political wilderness, banished from the halls of power at the general election. Without the steadying influence of New Zealand First, a cyclone of history was to bear down with its bitter gales, terrible seas and dreadful tides. A tide that turned and cast the country into the red, into a fiscal abyss. It was during this predicament that our crew was rallied and a steady course back to Parliament was navigated in spite of strong headwinds attempting to blow us off course. But it was thanks to you, for your support, your belief in our message, that the political winds of change started to blow. We got knocked down, but we got up again. and just returned from Gujarat, Delhi, Indonesia, Jakarta, Singapore, a series of meetings over the past week which included 21 flights over that week. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the leader of New Zealand First, the Right Honourable Winston Peters. Good afternoon. <laughs> uh, thank you for, in your busy lives, being out here this afternoon. I must say it was the most surprising welcome. Uh, we've got over 600 seats here wow. and standing room only, but outside there's a group shouting out, Winston, go home. <laughs> Uh, on the issue about which they're speaking, we've done our best. We've kept aid going in Gaza. We've spoken to 86 different people around the world about this issue. 
from Egypt to the representative from Palestine itself. Uh, we've uh, kept our aid going, as I've said, and joined other countries. And yet somebody out there in a the group shouts out, go home. <laughs> Strange that, because a part of one's family has been here a thousand years. And I had a look at that uh, group out there and I thought, none of you have. Yeah. <laughs> have you? <laughs> you know, uh, last year New Zealanders overwhelmingly voted for change. And that is exactly what this new government is bringing. We campaign New Zealand First to take back our country yeah. Yeah. and stop the disastrous economic and social path that New Zealand was on. In government and pulling back the curtain in the first three months, we've been shown that this country is in a much worse state, that too many politicians and observers in 2023 understood. Go back and read and hear what they said and what they wrote and ask yourself this question. What were they missing then that all of a sudden now, with hindsight and knowledge, they know? Because politics is about, amongst other things, having the presence of mind to see around the next corner and the corner after that. And only that way will you know, based on experience, what is the best thing to do. Today in the Sunday Star Times, journalist and former advisor to the Labour government, somebody I've got a great deal of respect for, Vernon Small, refers to the quotes, present government facing a fiscal hole of $5.6 billion. In short, that's what he says is the gap between what we've got and what we're going to have to, on the face of it, pay for. Now, Mr Small is right, of course, but he's wrong when he said last year politicians were, were, were warned of that. He's right, but he's wrong when he said politicians last year were warned of that. Because if he's right, then please show me when that warning came. Last year. Every party last year, before the March update of the fiscal situation of New Zealand, had given their State of the Nation speech. Only one party didn't. Waited till after the 15th of March to tell you what they really thought was going on. And likewise in August. Held off making a comment until the August update had come. And all the rest, including the commentators, just let fly, and that's one of the reasons why we're in the circumstance that we're in right now. Only one party in 2023 campaigned to alert New, Zealand's, New Zealanders onto just how bad things were. We pointed out where optimistic predictions were also false, like the house bias tax in Vernon Small's article today. Or dare I say, the overseas online gambling tax benefits in the article today, and in another, in another article written by a man called Cogren for the Herald, but nowhere does he refer to one party's manifesto in the 2023 election pointing to precisely those figures. Now, my friends in the media, go back and do some research and tell everybody here if what he's saying from the podium, not of truth, but of opinion, <laughs> is correct. Look, there's no sugar coating. We inherited a broken economy, a fractured society, and a country on the road to social disaster. That road was paved with the breathtaking naivety and incompetence from a lost Labour government. After the 2020 election, and without the handbrake, much maligned by you-know-who, without the handbrake, Labour cared more about feelings and ideology than the duty to competently govern our country. New Zealand's debt ballooned. There were multiple fiscal policies with no allocated funding. Even lunches in school in schools is in that category. And the insidious creep of racist co-governance that has spread through legislation and the public sector. Everywhere. All the way to the real estate licensing provisions. <laughs> Everywhere. Manipulated. No manifesto coverage, no campaign, just under the radar, debt of this type. And what were the media saying about it? <laughs> Deafening zero. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, we're never going to make it out of this demise if we tolerate that sort of behaviour. Over and over again. Or when you have the audacity to say there's something dramatically wrong here, 
not just about the policy, but about their lack of warning, they shout racist. Not just ideological theory, it was race-based theory, where some people's DNA made them, sadly, according to these people, and condoned by their cultural fellow travellers, their DNA made them somehow better than others. I've seen that sort of philosophy before. I saw it in Nazi Germany. We all did. We seen it elsewhere around the world in the horrors of history. But here, right in our country, tolerated by people whose job was to keep the system honest, this happened, where some people's DNA made them better than others. The left had simply run roughshod over society and the people of New Zealand with ideas and plans they had never, ever campaigned on. You know, this is time for reflection. Ladies and gentlemen, we can't fix this country until we acknowledge what is wrong with it. Labour has left us a folio of failures and a barrage of broken promises. It's actually breathtaking. And I don't think anyone can point back to a past period of our history where this has happened to the extent it's happened in this way. A crumbling, underfunded, overwhelmed health system. There they were. The Parliament had hardly set for the new year when they had over 6,000, the Leopold did, questions. What would you think of a government that's been there for six years when they've got 6,000 questions a day after they leave? Well, perhaps, maybe, on their own, they never had any damn answers in the first place. <laughs> That's the conclusion one would get. An education system that has seen a record number of children facing and failing basic standards and truancy rates. How can we possibly educate our children if more than 50% aren't at school? In a country where, in, 18, in 1877, when power was filled by people who mainly had a very modest education, but nevertheless they understood the importance of education. How can we possibly deliver to the taxpayer or need that child if they aren't at school? Do you see any sense of horror in the government or the bureaucracy about that? No. Just wild condemnation. Not shock horror and we'll do something about it, which is what this government is going to do, this new government. An unmanageable number of schools without adequate classrooms and many in the teaching force facing enormous strain. They did a survey of how many classrooms we were lacking, and the figure was just staggering. Did the previous Minister of Education tell you that? No. The Defence Force, that had lost more than a third of its personnel over the past three years. And there are some people in this country who don't care for Defence Force, but let me tell you this, if you want to face the real world or get any respect, you better do something about pulling your weight. You better start when you're talking to countries like India, dare I say it, Indonesia or Singapore and many others, start pulling your weight. But we had lost a third of our personnel over the past three years in the Defence Force. An undermanned police force, hemorrhaging officers to Australia, massive shortages in recruitment, massive increases in crime and youth ram raids and violence that are simply out of control and gang numbers that have ballooned over the past three years. And on top of all of that, we had a cost of living crisis. A housing crisis with skyrocketing prices and unprecedented numbers living in emergency hotels. Costing millions of dollars every day just for labour to take its conscience away from the streets and put it somewhere else at your expense. But never doing what they should have done. Run an economy where people could start to begin to buy their own home, which is what a great Labour Party did one time, beginning 1835. Remember the Labour Party's promise to build 10,000 homes in 10 years? <laughs> How many thousand do you think they got to? Did you say 10,000? 5,000? When Trifid went, it was less than 500. Uh, is he still in Parliament? Yes. Is there any accountability for that sort of faithless promise? No. How many business people did he go to who know how to build houses and never take their advice? Well, a whole stack, really, because we pointed them to people who were in housing businesses who could have built a thousand a year themselves. 
who could have built a thousand a year all by themselves. But they were never taken advantage of, no. He goes off and gets swamped by bureaucracy because they came there in terms of the problem with no knowledge of how to build a house in the first place. There are far more experts in this room than that. But that's what happened. And the rate of child poverty even higher than when in 2021, one a Prime Minister Ardern made herself the Minister of Child Poverty. Maybe she got the title wrong. <laughs> Maybe she should have put in the Minister for getting rid of child poverty. But in the end, child poverty went up. And a mental health system that has seen more and more people in desperate circumstances, where they dis deputed $1.9 billion to this purpose and got so confusingly bureaucratised that they built five hospital beds. <laughs> well, it would be a laughing matter if it wasn't so darn sad for so many young people. But where was the clamour from the gallery of the media shouting out, what on earth's going on here? No, a deafening silence. Yes, right. Why would that be? Well, I'll tell you why it is, because just last week, in a few uh, days, we've seen the implosion of a party on the left called the Greens. <laughs> Somebody in Parliament coming back from the election forecast that in his first speak back, a speech back from Parliament. Forecast that. But how many people down the far end down there covered how incompetent the Green Party are? <laughs> Hopelessly incompetent. Yes. People quali claiming qualifications they haven't got. <laughs> if anybody else in this system had a, made those demands, they'd be hounded out of Parliament. So why are they still there? Yes. And then you've got somebody who's described in the media article as a corporate high flyer. This is the latest one with a moko on her chin. <laughs> Given to her by her elders? Never asked that question, did they? No, just, oh, this is brilliant, this is green, we all love this stuff on the left. They couldn't run the school tuck shop. <laughs> and it's all imploding. <laughs> one after the other. Someone said when coming back to Parliament, to the Greens, this is your high point. It's all downhill from now. I just didn't realise how accurate and how quick I'd be and be in my forecasting and getting it right. You got a photograph of that now? Uh, I'm trying to give a speech here and you're mucking around distracting people. Well, this is not like the other parties. We're organised. We've got a crumbling basic infrastructure around the country with no plan, no funding and no idea. And here is the rub. The most awful thing to happen, which no one in this country in a real sense, and I think uh, in the media, without condemning them in this matter, have quite grasped what they're looking at. It's the uncontrollable level of new migrants entering our country over 133,000... <laughs> over 133,000 net in 2023 alone. None of which was forecast or told to you by anybody in the Labour Party, the Greens or the Party Māori, or dare I say it, our friends in the gallery. 133,000. That's more than the total population of Dunedin in just 12 months last year. Now, where was the funding and plan for any sort of infrastructure to cope with such numbers, let alone the demands that were there before they even came by people who were here as new migrants or older settlers as well. Where was the infrastructure for that, let alone the 133,000 coming in? The health infrastructure, the education infrastructure, housing infrastructure, and all the utilities required for that. Any political party or government can do that should go out of power and stay out of power. Yeah. Oh, I recall anybody ask questions about an unplanned immigration policy? Anybody ask questions about an unplanned immigration policy? It's instantly called something they can't even spell. 
is called xenophobic. No, we're not xenophobic. We're just not zombies. We want an immigration plan to ensure that every immigrant gets a fair go in our country the way they used to one time when we were number one in the world. But if you want to know why Labor has got no sense of humanity or kindness or a sense of action, have a look at that policy. Get past that. Labor left large numbers of people ostracised, demonised, shut down and shut out, ignored and cancelled, all because these people fought for their right to say, no, we disagree. Just on that matter alone, they shut them out, mandated them out, didn't care whether they had a job, partner had a job, what the family circumstances were. No. They were the podium truth. Any alternative was just shut down with the condemnation of you-know-who. Jessica, Jessica, Tova, Tova. Jessica, Jessica, Tova, Tova. <laughs> night after night. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, at the last election, voters did disagree in a massive, historic repudiation of Labour. And on the 14th of October last year, the people of Zealand voted for change, although it seems some in the media and the opposition parties refuse to accept the result. On more than one occasion, and just recently, in a thing which was very apposite as to its title, the Labour Party went and had a retreat. should never laugh at your own jokes. <laughs> but they had a retreat. And they tried to explain to New Zealanders that uh, may have voted for change, but even though they had voted for change, quotes, they didn't know what they were voting for. In a quotes. That's what they said. In the ashes of defeat, there they were, saying that you didn't know what you were doing. How's that? These people have never had a real job in the main. Right? They've been sucking off the taxpayer for years, all their life. In Hipkins' case, probably forever. And don't, gosh, don't shout out to me. Well, well you've been a politician a long time. Yes, I have. But I seriously run a law practice as well where the pay was a whole lot better than what it is now. <laughs> My problem was that way back then I thought I could change the world if I went into politics. <laughs> it's just taking a bit longer. <laughs> the self-denial and arrogance to imply Kiwis who voted for the new government and a new direction are somehow too unaware to know who and why they voted for by the people of this country. What is most astonishing is the lack of self-reflection of Labour MPs who had an outright majority for three years, massive majority, all by themselves, because they said, we solved COVID. We did it all by ourselves. They had a September in 2020 pamphlet where everything the government had done, they took credit for. They had done nothing for defence. We fixed that. They had done nothing about the Provincial Growth Fund. Shane Jones had fixed that. They had done nothing to turn around Kiwi Rail. We fixed that. But over and over and over again, they took all the darn credit and those people allowed them to. Right, so Labour's victory in 2020 is your mistake as well. Isn't it? Let's take some blame here. I'm not being unkind. I want to be helpful. We had three years of dripping self-righteous moral high horse where they were right and everyone else was wrong. And it is true, you know, there's nothing so difficult as to climb off your high horse gracefully. There's nothing so difficult as to climb off your high horse gracefully. And Mr Hipkins' comments reflect that. They made decisions, many in secret, echoing a Machiavellian-like approach to governing. We who have the power are always right. The weaker is always wrong, and that the ends justify the means. The problem for Labour was that there were no ends because they had no concept 
of where they were going, the hapless freight train ran out of tracks and the means only exposed an unheralded level of contempt. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no one more expert on Labour's contempt for democracy than with all a sense of humility, the person you're listening to now. Why? Well, having governed with former Prime Minister Helen Clark, one can say that there are light years between her and the last two Labour leaders in their most basic understanding of democracy. Yeah. And right now, on March 24, they are hell-bent in a race to the bottom of the political wilderness with Party Māori and the Greens. In other words, these three parties are arguing over who can be most culturally woke and go the furthest to the left. You hear them on the interviews, you watch them on TV, always over-gesturing like an Italian waiter. They've got a vowel sandwich for every word. The more vowels, the better. Make them sound good. And they're getting away with all this bulldust. Until now. They're out there exposing opposition and they're going to be there one long, long time until one, until one realises that politics is about people. In our months into being in opposition, many still are still blind to the fact that the leftist groupthink of their government is the rod that they have made for their own backs now. Labour, dramatically and sadly, has deserted the traditional blue-collar workers of New Zealand. Any of us that studied history in this country saw a party in 35 get rid of its previous sort of pinko communist state ownership of land plan in 1932. I wasn't alive at the time, mind you. <laughs> but they got rid of it 30, from 32 almost to 35, and they got in, and they got down to doing the practical things that people want. Safe, affordable, private housing. Access to education uh, for the escalators for take the young people as far as they could, but in those days more for manual education as well. Access to health if people needed it. And above all, the fourth one, was first world wages. Those four things is what Labour set out to do. And they were magnificently successful. No matter what category you like, particularly under Peter Fraser. And then a National Party came in in 1951 and thought, 49 and then 51 and thought, ah, this is so good, we'll just change this name to a property owned democracy. <laughs> Steal the policy, call it a property owned democracy and keep going basically in the same pathway, the same thrust. And year after year after year, they had 5.5% growth and took us to number one in the world. That's what we were capable of then, and we're still capable of it now. But it's the leadership that's wrong, and the policies that are wrong that have taken us thus far. They have deserted the two blue-collar workers. The slow boil movement of the party of the far left has caused a huge number of long-time Labour voters to feel abandoned by a party that one stood for the ordinary, hard-working Kiwi. And you know something? We are still working the second longest hours in the OECD to Japan. So it isn't the worker in New Zealand that's a problem, or the people in New Zealand that's a problem. It's the political dichotomy and the philosophy. It has to be. Instead, Labour now seems to care more about left-wing social justice issues, ideological crusades and woke cultural Marxism. The very same failings and racial obsessions of the Party Māori and the Greens. Did you see the Māori Party come to Parliament, the opening Parliament this year? They had half of the plumage from the native birds on their head. <laughs> Truly, I thought they were protected species, but no, half of them on the head. And they're anti-mining, but they had half the green stone around their chest. <laughs> Truly and an absolute contempt for a place that took Māori to Parliament in 1867 and saw people like uh, Ngata and Pumari and Buck in a great former age and before that Deputy Prime Minister Carroll way back centuries ago. Here this is this theatre where Māori have got now greater numbers than ever before because of MMP 
And here they turn up with this outrage and shouting the rest of us down. Being there five seconds, shouting the rest of us down. And if you're Maori in this audience, you tell me we're on the marae, that sort of behaviour is loud. You're allowed to have a difference of opinion, you're allowed to disagree, but we're on the marae, is that sort of behaviour allowed? But no, no, the very interface of Māori coming to Parliament in the form of the Party Māori is now saying, that's us, that's our image, that's how we behave. And our response from New Zealand first, oh no, you don't, sunshine. Right. <laughs> You're looking for trouble, you've come to the wrong place. Right. <laughs> the once great Labour Party of Savage and Fraser has turned into the party of moral outrage and political inertia. But just now, before I go any further, I want to talk about uh, my friends in the media. <laughs> uh, uh, and by the way, uh, can I say to you all in the media, welcome back. <laughs> because last year in this campaign we were packing the halls. These meetings will see nobody from the media here. Yeah. At all. And when they contest that, let me show you meeting after meeting after meeting with the same coverage that it is today to prove that. So please don't say it didn't happen. But welcome back. <laughs> As a New Zealand First leader, in an article written not so long ago about the state of our media, we said this. New Zealand First has always believed and held the view that the fourth estate is essential to any successful, functioning democracy. But it's not just the existence of the fourth estate that is, is essential. It's the need of a fourth estate that is impartial, yes. politically neutral, yes. fair and objective. Is that too much to ask for? Impartial, politically neutral, fair and objective. These are the qualities and attributes that the public expect of an effective media in any free society. Because in the end, you're their master, like you're our master in politics. When did it ever occur to them that things have changed? These are the qualities and attributes that the public expect of an effective media in a free society. Something that is lacking in much of the media landscape, alas, today. The revelation that News Hub is set to close as well as jobs from TVNZ is obviously devastating for those who will lose their jobs. It's probably more devastating for their spouses, for their children and for their families. But it's also seriously concerning for the robustness of our local media landscape in particular. Not just in the metropolitan areas, but once you get out of there, what's going to happen to the rest of New Zealand, yep. provincial New Zealand? who, after all, make the money to keep this country going. <laughs> One of those reasons is the increased lack of trust in New Zealand's media that has seen much of the public actively avoid engaging with them. The impartiality of media should be the foundation of its reporting, but in the main it has morphed into the past few years to rely on opinion, narrative, agendas and clickbait. And who gives a rat's derriere what some of you guys think? <laughs> Why don't you tell everybody what was sung about in a grand famous song by Phil Collins when he said you've got to hear both sides of the story. Get a chance today, go and play it to yourselves. He's talking about the need to hear both sides of the story. It's the romance and glamour of the media, for goodness sake. Someone is telling you over there, in this marketplace of ideas, these things are being discussed. And we're going to tell you all what those ideas might be. Over the past four years in the sign-up of media outlets to receive 55 million of public funding through the Public Interest Journalism Fund. Did you get that? The Public Interest Journalism Fund has cemented that mistrust from the public for obvious reasons, most of which it seems is lost on the very media outlets that receive those funds. Can you believe the number of people had a go at me when I said you took a bribe? Wow, you should have got the soil and getting steamed up. How does he dare say a thing like that? Just took it for a fact that what they did was above board. It's a plain fact that in order for media organisations to be eligible for funding, they had to sign up to certain criteria and conditions. Is that true, Damon? 
and ladies down there? Yes, it is. Including reciting certain narratives of the Labour government at the time. Jacinda Dern herself said when addressing the issue of alternative or dissenting views about COVID-19, she said this in quotes, we had to act so we made it a priority to establish a public interest journalism fund to help our media continue to produce stories that keep New Zealanders informed, end of quotes. Or in short, funding media to promote a government narrative, the quote, single source of truth. And before some smart Alex says, but you were there, the answer is, oh, no, I wasn't. When they came to us, we said, you can't, you must be joking. We'll be accused by everybody else of giving a bribe. But they went around the ownership and said, that guy's stopping us helping you. Didn't they, gentlemen, at the back? And ladies, come on, tell everybody here today. One of those conditions was based on a purely political view that is not supported by many in New Zealand or political parties. The statement that the media organisation must, quote, actively promote the principles of partnership, participation and active protection under Te Tiriti or Waitangi, acknowledging Māori as a Te, te, te Tiriti partner, end of quotes. Māori are a treaty of Waitangi partner, end of quotes. If they didn't sign up to this condition, they wouldn't get the money. Is that true or false? The deafening silence down the back tells me it's true. <laughs> if they didn't sign up to this condition, they didn't get the money. How can a political, neutral and independent media organisation give balanced political commentary, analysis and in particular opinions when this was the basis of the funds they received for their very survival? This was the sinister seed that provided the platform for inevitable political bias. And frankly, if I was a media person, I'd despise the very people that did that. I despise the patronage. I despise the fact that many women will go back in history and think that way they despised the kind of chauvinism as part of society. And the, way, the reason why so many Maori back then used to despise a certain approach which said, look, if with us, without us, you can't get anywhere. If I was a media person, I'd have despised it then. But I despise it now, and I'm not a media person, but I'm bringing it to your attention as to what happened. It created a media environment where certain left-wing political narratives and agendas seeped into much of what the media presented to the public, where any opposing views were shut down, cancelled, and labelled as far-right or fringe. I was being interviewed by RNZ in a campaign last year, now it's like, how's this for neutrality? When this interviewer says about our candidates, where do you get these people? <laughs> How do you like that? What would have anybody sitting there with producers behind her and the ownership of RNZ thinking that could possibly be an acceptable approach to an interview where neutrality was the key issue? Well, she found out in the end where we got them from and we're on the rise and they're on the dive. Right? The landscape of mainstream media is a dramatic progress in need, in need of a dramatic process of change. That is an undeniable fact. The current situation has highlighted that the mainstream media need serious self-reflection. We are in need of a fourth estate that's robust in our democracy more desperately than ever but one that focuses on thinking news, not breaking news. And by the way, which was the only party in the last election that had a broadcasting policy, that still believes you should be supported properly. And it's not going to ask for any favour if you do your job properly. How's that? <laughs> As you know, the new coalition government faces massive challenges. While there is much that's wrong with New Zealand today, there is nothing that cannot be fixed by what is right with New Zealand today. If you're coming from outside, and many people do look at New Zealand from outside, they don't understand why this country's not doing better, because they believe we've got everything going for us. There's nothing that we've got wrong with us 
that cannot be fixed up but what, by what is right with us. And with the right policies, the right attitude, and above all the right commitment, we can secure a much better future. New Zealand first campaigned for a full two years before the election, packing halls around the country, talking to the people, listening to the people, and with your help, we made it back into government. Our campaign message was for voters to join us to take back our country. And that's what we intend to do. Yeah. Yeah. Where we as New Zealanders take back our country and how important that is. Take back our country to what we once were. The number one democracy in the world, and we were. Number one economy in the world. And where we were the envy of others for our egalitarianism. What does that mean for sharing our wealth? Political scientists could not believe that all the philosophy and all the ideology offshore, here's a country way out in the South Pacific that actually did it. And uh, above all, uh, unity and national pride. We are the party that is bringing steel to our government through the hard times and above all experience and common sense. We have a highly experienced team of ministers and MPs like Shane Jones, Casey Costello, Mark Patterson, Jenny Markroft, James Arbuckle, Andy Foster and Tania Unkovich. And our caucus shows it. Have a look at all the other controversy going on other political parties. Have a look. Compare it all. One party is getting on with the darn job. The coalition agreement New Zealand First fought for is the blueprint for the changes that New Zealand First will make as part of the coalition government. Throughout the campaign we heard from our supporters what they wanted and what our country needed us to deliver on in the new direction going forward. To list just a few, for our economy, infrastructure and cost of living, we're going to establish an inquiry into banking competition. We're going to find out whether Ned Kelly has been robbing Ned Kelly back in Australia <laughs> is not robbing us in New Zealand. How come there's been five inquiries by Australia into Australian banks and not one in New Zealand? Yeah. We're going to strengthen the powers of the Groceries Commissioner. We know we're being ripped off in many ways because the costs don't match up. And the divergence is massive. Sometimes 16% cost spread or 90% cost spread town after from town. We're going to establish a national infrastructure agency. We're going to, and already have, established a regional infrastructure fund creating jobs and much needed infrastructure around the country, in the provinces, where the great wealth of this country is created. And we're going to investigate the reopening of Marsden Point Refinery. Yeah. Sometimes one looks at New Zealand politics and wonders, you know, what is it about these appalling decisions that people don't get, including my friends in the media? When they allowed Marsden Point to shut down, they exposed us massively to supply issues. Just massively. And with the coastal, coastal shipping closed down, we could nevertheless, in the old system, keep 50% of our critical economy going, including all the emergency systems. All that's in jeopardy now. And you wonder, how on earth did they get away with that? With Megan Woods talking about green hydrogen. Yeah, when? And where? All these sorts of alternatives put out there while we're exposed in the way we are. Sort of reminds you, you know, I remember when we were young, my father got an alarm clock. We weren't getting up early enough in the morning. It's quarter to five in those days, milk cows. But he got a new alarm clock. I tell you what, we rocked out of bed in the first morning, <laughs> second morning, the third morning, but after a month, we were still sleeping in. Have we woken up? And that's what's happening in New Zealand politics as well. And for restoring law and order in our streets, we're going to train 500 new frontline police men and women. Introduce measures to tackle youth crime. We're going to want to know where their parents were on the night or the day of the offence. Yeah. Is it so wrong to give people social sustenance and welfare? and expect something back. The 35 Labour Party didn't demanded that, and they were right then and they're right now. The present crowd are just, how shall I say it, beneficent angels with no sense of accountability. 
We want to know what that child's doing there because we're helping that family now. You're helping that family and that's the least you're entitled to know. We're going to amend the Sentencing Act to ensure appropriate consequences for criminals. We're going to put the rights of the victims before the rights of the offenders. And on education and health, we're going to go back to a curriculum on academic, on academic achievement and not ideology, including the removal and replacement of gender sexuality. Yeah. And, and relationship-based education guidelines. We're going to repeal the Therapeutic Products Act 2023. And after Labor gave $1.9 billion for mental health and got five hospital beds, yes, we are going to, and New Zealand First is responsible for this, and exclusively New Zealand First, properly fund Gumboot Friday. Yeah. And we're going to ensure Plunkett is funded to do its job properly. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, uh, if you're one of those thriving, alive 65-year-olds... We're going to keep the superannuation at 65 and upgrade the super gold card and veterans card. <laughs> We're not going to take an agistic view of older people. As happened recently when they were referring to uh, someone losing their job at 72, they were referring to him but they put my photograph up on the TV <laughs> one. You know, if I was in TV1 and worrying about job cuts and funding, I wouldn't have been so damn stupid. <laughs> I wouldn't want to provoke someone, would I? <laughs> Nothing about me, it's about this guy. I'm overseas at the time, but I hear I'm on TV1 News. <laughs> Very subtle, isn't it? <laughs> and for strengthening our democracy and freedoms... Ensure public funded sporting bodies support fair competition that's not compromised by rules relating to gender. Yeah. Yeah. And here we are in this university town, but we're going to legislate to make English an official language of New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. To all of our opponents out there, we say, for goodness sake, catch up. English is the language internationally of commerce. Yes. And we're lucky enough to speak this language that never started in England, it started in Germany. Don't you know that? <laughs> it's worldwide, it's universal now. So let's make the most of it. We're going to protect freedom of speech for ruling out the introduction of hate speech legislation. Yes. Uh, I noticed my colleague, Mr Seymour, having some contradicts with this person's in charge of that sort of stuff. <laughs> I couldn't believe what she was posting. Unbelievable. It meant to be neutral. Posting this stuff. We're going to end all COVID-19 vaccine mandates. Still in operation. And it was we who promised a full-scale investigation into the COVID pandemic with widening terms of reference led by the right people to ensure you get the real answers. Yes. We're going to ensure, ensure national interest test is undertaken before New Zealand accepts any agreements from the UN and its agencies. Yes. We're going to remove, remove, remove curve governance from the delivery of public services. Yes. And we're going to prioritise the delivery of public services. We're going to stop all work on this fictional thing called Hey Poor Poor. Yeah. We're going to amend the Waitangi Tribunal legislation yeah. to get them going back to do the job they were meant to do. Yeah. And then we're going to amend the Marine and Coastal Area Act, which no less today has 600 claims for the New Zealand coastal environment. We fixed it in 2004. It was changed in 2011. Here come 600, over 600 claims to the maritime area of this country. And every Māori here knows. 
As every Pacifica person knows, the sea is our highway. That's how we got here. Over 5,000 years from mainland China, all the way across the Pacific to New Zealand, to all of a sudden, here we go, uh oh, it's ours. No, for our nation it is an asset, but it's not based on race. These are only some of the things that we have submitted in our agreement, and many are already completed or work is already well underway. We have a lot to accomplish in this term through our coalition agreement that was designed to turn this country around. But here's the critical thing. We're developing an economic plan. For far too long, New Zealand's economy has been the victim of ideological dogma, and there are people in this room who know what I mean. If anyone doubts that, have a look at how far this country has declined as opposed to, example, Australia. Just look over there and see what's happened. Forty years ago, New Zealand had an economic far-right revolution. Well, Labour got in, threw the manifesto in the rubbish bin, pulled out the secret agenda under Roger Douglas, while next door in Australia, a government of the same ilk, Labour, under Hawke and Keating, went down the pathway of incremental change massively for the better. Build on what we've got, they said, and we'll get better and better. Not us, no. Everything was thrown out, the baby with the bath will look at the consequence. And the result, Australia grew in real terms 35% larger in their economy than ours. Imagine if our economy was 35% larger now. All the things we're screaming, worrying about in this, in this last campaign would not be there in the same way. But this obvious fact still blinds many New Zealand commentators as to why they were wrong back then and are still wrong today and how New Zealand should go forward. Like overseas, look overseas at the successful economies of Nordic countries. Iceland, 350,000 people, per capita income over 22,000 more than us. Per person. So size matters? No, it doesn't. What you do with the assets does. Look overseas at the successful companies of the Nordic countries, or like Singapore. This magnificent country, the size of Lake Taupo. Ask yourself, what's wrong with us? Or Taiwan, no resources. Second highest population density to Bangladesh. Look what they've done with that economy. Or dare I say it, and this is the one that I find most amazing because everybody always painted the Irish as so contrary. An argumentative. But in the 80s they began and turned their country to being a Celtic tiger. Brilliant strategy based on smart economic policy. And we must do the same. Many of those countries are small or have few natural resources at all. But they all have an economic plan where their people are their number, one resource. And that's why education and compulsory School, schooling is going to come back like lightning. Where education is critical, where they employ incubators for innovation and social mobility, where they have taxation incentives for real business growth to attract investment into the right areas. You know, we should be doing that. We will not be short of money if we've got the right policy. We've got the resources. We need to add value to it dramatically in our country. How come it is, you know, this country, at this present time, launches the fourth greatest number of rockets into the atmosphere of all the countries on Earth? We do. Do you know that? Well, hell on, don't know that. But we can be doing these sorts of things over and over again, where we support bright minds and brilliant ideas and keep the people here. Where education is critical. You know, we are the primary focus on education on expenditure, rather, is on wealth creation, exports and production, not consumption. Not consumption. Not here today, gone tomorrow. Before the last election, we were campaigning saying that it was an inflection election. There was no doubt that we, if we didn't get it right, with the choice of a new government, with New Zealand first at the heart of that government, our country was on the pathway of economic and social and cultural disaster.
You know, and in government we got there and pulled back the curtain to see what Labor had left us to deal with. And there's no doubt that New Zealand made the right choice in 2023. New Zealanders voted for change, for a new direction, and they knew that change meant something for the better, despite what Mr Hipkins and the Labor Party and the Murray Party and the Greens might want to believe. And New Zealand First has come back into government after being written off and ignored. We made it back with your support because we bring steel to New Zealand's cause. We bring steel to our government. We stood for a change and a chance to make it count for all New Zealanders and the values and principles that once had made this country the greatest country on earth to live in. We're still that country. We have this real chance to, ladies and gentlemen, take back our country. Now, we are very much aware we're in Palmerston North. This is a university city where every year of late students are taught that the Treaty of Waitangi was a partnership between the signatories. You're the ones that are paying for these lessons, by the way. So listen up. That misconstruction of what happened on February 1840 is a recent one. Never the words of Buck or Pomeroy, or dare I say it, of famous Carol, former the Deputy Prime Minister. No, it's a recent construction. A simple agreement between the signatories at Waitangi on 6th of February 1840 could not have been a partnership. Why? Well, if no one was on the 5th of February 1840, whether in England or in the far-flung reaches of the British Empire, including New Zealand, in partnership with Queen Victoria, then how could the Maori people be the day after? I'm saying this, as I said in, 18, in 1967, when Cook made his judgment and hinted at it. I said it back then. If no one in the Commonwealth, and the Empire back then, or downtown, dare I say it, Buckingham Palace, was in partnership with Queen Victoria, how could the Maori people be the day after? And if you can't answer that question, stop <laughs> teaching bulldust. The protagonists of the Treaty of Waitangi being an equal partnership have never, can never and will never answer that very simple question. And until they do, they are simply showering shibboleths of deceit. After Waitangi Day, the ownership of land for all landowners, including Maori landowners, was guaranteed. And only the Crown had the right of purchase. Maori understood that back then because the Waitangi event was something the Māori people asked for, did not have it foisted upon them in the way people say now, in the way they insult their former leadership and their chieftains of that time, as though they knew nothing, and somehow because they went to some university they know everything. Why did I not say this? Because British citizens we became. British citizens we became. We would be rule of law beneficiaries under the change and under Crown protection against other rapacious colonial powers. Today, what is being taught at universities on this matter denies the simple fact that neither Queen Victoria nor her successors could constitutionally enter with their subjects a partnership. You've got these massive blocks of fact which these people are skirting around preaching something that is not true. And from this academic deceit and legal mis misconstruction have come all men of demands based on ethnicity of race, inevitably to the benefit of self-appointed Maori elite, but inevitably, again, at the enormous cost of ordinary Maori. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as said before, what is it that Maori really want across this country. Well, they want a safe, affordable house. Not for themselves, but hopefully for one of their relations, mother, father, or children. They want access readily to health systems that work. And now in this modern society, more than ever before, they want the chance for their young people to climb onto the escalators of education and go as far as they possibly can. 
Remember that great movement called the American Civil Rights Movement? Did they want to set up black institutions? No, they didn't. They wanted to bust down the door to the best white ones, or dare I say it, the best American ones. They kept their eye on the prize and ended up with a black president. And now a black vice president. They never took their mind off what was needed, and nor should Maori in this country take their eyes off those four things. Because if those four things are provided, then every other cultural thing you might need can be fixed up. And whilst you're at it, who was it who supported and funded Kapahaka? You got any idea? <laughs> can I hear? <laughs> the Maori Sports Awards. The Maori Wardens. Put the Maori Women's Welfare League on separate footing. I can be here all afternoon telling you who that person is, but I'm too modest. <laughs> But those four things Māori want, you know something? Every other ethnic group in this country wants as well. And that's what we're going to remain unified on, fixing those things up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, we must remember New Zealand is the beneficiary of Western values, democracy and the rule of law. We've all got something to contribute. How many times some of us at school we were always asked, can you play the guitar? Yes. I just assumed you could. No, I can't actually. <laughs> but it was assumed that certain people got certain skills. We're all different. But it's putting those skills together that's important now. We're the beneficiary of Western values, democracy and the rule of law. And democracy in the history of humanity and this world and this earth is a very brief flower and don't take a risk on it. And the advancement and enhancement of those principles have only occurred in those societies that have united together as one people and who celebrate their nationhood instead of perpetuating division. We want to build a great new culture, Kiwi culture in this country, where everybody gets to have an input. Not forgetting our past and our differences. Good Lord, I'm so pleased that something's happened in our country because until then, uh, we had the right food, but we didn't have the right cooks. <laughs> Some people don't like me for saying this, but uh, I'm part Maori and part Scots. And I've been around Polynesia, and I think the worst cooks in Polynesia ran into the worst cooks in Europe. <laughs> Come on, you Scots know that. <laughs> Who on earth would eat a haggis? <laughs> but the point is we can, uh, we can do the other thing and, and improve. We learned how to save money. With cooperation, conciliation and inclusivity and teamwork, our country can make it out of the crisis to a better future for every New Zealander. We can become again the envy of the world. Remember, politicians are not meant to be your masters, they are meant to be your servants. Too much of our country was left in a real mess, and that's because the people who were suffering were not the ones who caused the mess. Our once great society was built on hard work and a fair go for everyone. We built a reputation for a fair go. Bold steps were needed now and needed now to lift our country back where it belongs. Countries that do well work together as a team and everyone has a part to play. We have a plan. We now have hope. We together can change New Zealand. We will rebuild our country for the many and not the few. We will reconstruct our economy for every New Zealander and not just a self-appointed elite few. That is our vision, that is our commitment, and that is our commission to protect and save this great country, New Zealand. We got knocked down, but we got back up again, yes. and nothing's going to stop us now.
appropriate? Yes, it is. Why? Because that's what it's based on. It's based on racial preference, based on somebody being superior. And that's what they're saying. Our ethnicity, our DNA is superior. They said that to you. They told you that. So get what it means. How do you think it no, would no, make no. our Jewish Excuse community me. feel? Excuse me. Excuse me. Next question. How do you think that would make our Jewish community feel? Oh, well, you're clairvoyant, are you? Well, I think that they would understand entirely what I'm saying. You think? I mean, a reference oh, no, no. to Next question. is a bit on Next the question. Next question. You railed uh, again. No, I said I've seen the taste and the faint of what that looks like in other countries and other eras. That's what I said. Didn't say what the, that question said, because words matter. So what's your question? You had a go at Rogernomics. Rogernomics was about balancing budgets and fiscal restraint. Does that mean that you are opposed to Nationals' attempts to ba balance the budget and to exercise fiscal restraint? Well, that would be the most, that would be the worst inaccurate misconstruction of Roger Longs I've ever heard. Because in the end, they ended up with what? The highest family support mechanism as a result of their failure that we've ever had in our past, going all the way back to 1935, the Labour Party. So it wasn't about fiscal restraint, it was about failure in the end. The so you also said that Vernon Small was correct today when he said we're facing the 5.6 billion dollar fiscal hole. So is that really what the country is facing? The 5.6 billion dollars of fiscal hole. Well, the, well, if you look at what was uh, talking about last year, you, all that was for, foreseeable. It wasn't new. He, he's saying specifically the difference between the campaign promises and the funding gap is 5.6 billion. No, no, no. He, the part he left out, which is patently obvious, is the growth rate is not what we thought it was. That's the real difference. Mr. Can you walk Peters, us through what yes. happened in, in the year with your comments around there being a lack of evidence, um, or, or questioning what the evidence was around the killing of the Sikh? I didn't, I didn't question what the evidence was. I said there was an inquiry and I'm waiting its outcome. That's what all trained lawyers would do. Not, ju no, not jump to a conclusion beforehand. In the same way as when there was an inquiry into the Salisbury event, I was being asked the next, the next day when I was Foreign Minister to give my verdict. And I said, no, no, I'm going to wait what the, I'm going to wait till the inquiry has been completed. That's all I said. Because the Indian media, they seized a, upon a comment that you made where you said, where's the evidence? Well, that was, uh, my question is, I want to hear and see all the evidence. And while I was there, I talked to the uh, uh, High Commissioner from Canada there and had a long discussion about that very issue so that I'll get the record straight because I was being misquoted by one source on this matter. You, it you, wasn't a controversy. I didn't say anything out of the water. I said what any darn trained lawyer would say. When the inquiry is over, we'll hear the evidence and we'll know exactly what they were the saying. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs provided you with a background on this case before you made those comments? No, I guess, yes, they told me about this case. Had they given me the background? No, because guess why? The inquiry hasn't been completed yet. But it was based on five eyes intelligence. No, look, excuse me, the inquiry is not complete yet. Have you got that part right? Why well, did you give us? Yes. You, you, spent, you spent a lot of your speech today talking about Labour and, and the media as well, very similar to what you said in your public meetings before the election. So what do you say, what was new for you? What do you, what do you claim to be new in that speech today that you were telling your supporters? Well, the new part is the part about the economic reconstruction. We've got the capacity to turn this country around, but only with the right policies. We'll not be short of resources or money if we've got the right policies. But the can we attract money from overseas? Of course we can if we've got the right policies. But they're based on some of the economies that I referred to today who have done with accuracy and precision and performance just that. And in the, in the, in the recorded video that was played before your speech began, uh, you referenced the, your state of the nation as the real state of the nation. Is that in reference to uh, the Prime Minister's one, which was made a few weeks ago? Do you think your one is more accurate than this? I know where you're going, but you're not going to land. Given the <laughs> $5.6 billion dollar deficit, the surprise that you've got looking at the accounts, can the country afford the income tax cuts? Uh, I know what you're trying to do here. We've got a budget we're preparing for the 30th of May, and that's a, part of a process of which we're part of. Uh, when you ask all those questions, you've got to look at what are possible solutions to this huge gap and turn rapidly the economy's growth rate around. So it's not impossible, but to answer that question now would be wrong, premature, when you're in a coalition government. Could I ask yeah, about you about what you're saying? You're saying it would be wrong. Do you no, mean, no, to answer the question now yeah, you mean, you would, mean, be, would wrong. be politically wrong. Because well, you disagree with the government's policy and you don't no, want no, to, no, no, to be no, saying no, no, that. No, 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 no. Look, as an experienced person, I don't do translations or interpretations. I understand English plainly. It'll be wrong to break up the way of working and say now what you want inside a closed discussion to come to an outcome which will be all before you on the evening of the 31st or 30th of May. Can I ask you about your answer to that question would have been yes? What? 
can the country afford the tax cuts? You didn't say yes. Oh, no, no. I admit that there's a construction of the economic plan going forward where all these things can be done, but not the plan I've heard just yet. However, we're in coalition talks all the time to see what the construction pathway forward might be. So the tax cuts that... I was a believer in Lee Kuan Yew, I was believer in Lee Kuan Yew, uh, Singapore, a long time before many. Studied Taiwan system 40 years ago. Was an island when it was starting off as a poverty-stricken country and made a great change. And have been to Iceland to study how a country like that looks like something off this... Off, it is off this planet. It looks like something from another, another part of the, of the yes. stratosphere, so to speak. And it's a magnificent success story. And we've got lessons we can learn So the, the, co the, the tax cuts that were outlined in the coalition document, are you saying that they, those are particularly... could potentially be changed given the fiscal environment, as Chris Hipkins called it? Uh, with respect, Jason, if I was saying that, it would be in my speech, wouldn't it? Well, could you? I mean, I'm just following. Yeah, I mean, up on yeah, well, why don't you guys go and get a job at university as interpreters? Well, we're just well, go, we're go, asking go, you for. Well, go off the go off the law courts and become an interpreter. All the tax cuts for as giving evidence. In the coalition because even though, even, they even, still, they're, even, they're they're given, even though they're given even though they're evidence in English, you're interpreting the English. Well, could yes, I just yes, consider, yes, considering please. the deficit that has been talked about here, can the coalition government afford all of the policies that it has committed to, or are there going to have to be changes? Our ones, yes. What about the coalition? Thank you very much. Can we, can we talk about China, the China, Chinese?